I heard someone ask me this question recently. Has it ever occurred to you that God needed Christmas? We mean that in the sense of God needed a way to demonstrate the great love that He had for us. And so God used the circular event of Christmas bringing the birth of the Christ child so that He could demonstrate to you and I all that it means about Him being with us. And that's why we've been so excited this month to share about God with us and all that Christmas brings to that. And again, what all that that can mean to us. So the verse that we have using as our theme verse, as it were, from Matthew chapter 1, and again, here it was, it, uh, it says uh, there in verse 23, when it reminds us about, again, God being with us. It gives us at the beginning of the Christmas story, and it tells us how that, behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel which translated means God with us. Wow. The fact that, as we said last week, the very God who sent the child was the child. And so Jesus Christ was born, certainly did not begin His existence in Bethlehem, but He became man there as we celebrate the birth this month. He became man to show us that God did in fact come to be with us. That God is in fact with us. And so we talked last week about how that God is with us both in the good times and the bad, right? And we spoke about how that God is certainly with us on the mountain and in those times of great blessing and in the times when the job is going well or the promotion has come, the relationships are strong and how that God is with us through those good times in those mountaintop experiences as it were. And in those times, God often gives us something that we need to hold on to. Because God knows that we don't live all of life on the mountain, do we? And that the valleys will come. And so we reminded ourselves that how much that we enjoy God on the mountain, but we really get to know Him intimately through the valley. And again, every one of us, it's sometimes been said that when it comes to a valley or when it comes to trouble, when it comes to problem, that most of us are either just coming out of a valley or we are perhaps even in a valley right now or we are preparing for a valley. And doesn't it often seem that way? And the fact that God is with us, not just on the mountain, but God is with us through the valley. You know, here's one of the things that valleys in life, those troubles that we have, those times of suffering, of those times of pain, of the times when we go through the valley. One of the great pulls of the valley that it would at least like to do on us is it likes to always call attention to us those circumstances of life that are tough and the pain and the suffering and the valley. And it calls attention to, hey, you're not on the mountain anymore. And it's like... On the mountain, I was like this, uh, but in the valley, I am like this. And so there can be that pull. You know, on the mountain, I was healthy, but now in the valley, I am sick. And by the way, don't those valleys often come even pretty soon after a mountain? And it seems like it was just yesterday that I was healthy. And now in the valley, I'm sick. You know, I was talking to one of our Calvary members this week uh, that is uh, currently at Bryan East. So shout out to my friend James uh, that perhaps will be listening to this. Um, uh, you know, things were going well, and then all of a sudden a quick series of events and some heart pain and ended up by midweek with a... Um, surgery, emergency surgery that had to happen. And 
Double bypass surgery, but are doing much better now. But again, it almost seems sometimes like just yesterday, I was healthy, but now I'm sick. I was strong, but now in the valley, I feel weak. You know, I was confident, but now in the valley, I feel fearful. I was winning, and now I am failing. Uh, perhaps it was, I was in a strong relationship. And it seems like just yesterday, uh, but now I'm not even sure if he or she even cares about me. That's what the valley will often do for us. Uh, get us into that comparison. Boy, I so was this way, and now I am so this way. But God wants to give something to us even this morning to remind us that God is in fact with us even in the valley. Because He's been there. You know, as we even think about the Christmas story and the very early Days, months, and years in the life of Jesus on this earth. I mean, think with me about all the valleys that he went through, even as a young child, even before he was born. I mean, think in terms of how that even his mother, who was, as the Bible says, great with child. She was very pregnant at the time. And yet she was forced to travel over a pretty long distance by animal, even as she was carrying Christ. Uh, pretty much a valley, right ladies? Uh, think about how that with Jesus and how that there was no room for them in the inn when the time came for Jesus to be delivered and the uh, Motels were completely filled up. And the Christmas story reminds us that there was no room in the inn. And so Christ was born in a stable, as it were. Uh, wrapped in swaddling clothes. Laid in a manger. Not the greatest times. Uh, we could consider that a valley. Many of those things that again took place. Think about even some other things. Think about how that a price was put on His head by the king. I mean, the king said, hey, listen, I want to get rid of this one who might someday become king of the Jews. And so there was such selfishness and anger in the king's heart that he called for every male child two years and under to be put to death. Well, even that valley that Christ went through even as a baby. And the fact that again, that all the Jewish males then were going to be killed because of his birth. And it would lead to the time where his family would even have to flee the country. And then it goes on and on through the years that Christ was on this earth. Christ knew what it meant about going through the valley, about through the tough times. You see, and again, so because Christ came to us, and because Christ became one of us at Christmas, then what I want to get through to my heart and to yours today is because of that fact that He can now sympathize with us in our weaknesses, in our valleys as it were. And so um, wherever you find yourself at this morning, whatever that you are going through, or those loved ones around you are going through, one of the great new stories about Christmas is that Jesus not only knows, He's not only with us, but He understands. Because He's been there. He's been in the valley. He's been through the tough times. And there's perhaps no better place in Scripture to remind us of that than what we find in the book of Hebrews. Because in the book of Hebrews, it's going to give us another interesting picture, as it were, of Jesus. And it's going to say that He is our high priest. You know, we talked last week about how that in the very beginning of the Christmas story, we were reminded how that Jesus was going to be called by two names. He would be called Jesus, literally meaning Jehovah is salvation, because He would save people from their sin. And that was the very mission that he would have by coming to this earth to save people from their sin. But he would also be called Emmanuel, 
meaning God with us. And that was the method that He would use. That was why God needed Christmas. Because He would use the method of God becoming man and living among us and being our Emmanuel, God with us. And only by that could He in fact live a perfect life, die on the cross, be raised from the dead, and be able to save us from our sin. And in doing so, in living this life, and a life of valleys and pain and suffering, He was going to be able to sympathize with us. He was going to be able to be our high priest. Simply meaning that He was going to be one who was going to be able to offer Himself for us and be the mediator, the go-between between us and God. And look at these exciting verses. The writer of Hebrews puts it to us this way. And he says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Wow! And so Jesus, because He came to us, because He became one of us, now God is with us, and in the most real sense of the word, He can be with us in the valley because He's been there, because He understands. And so we have a high priest that can sympathize with us even in our weaknesses. You know, the book of Hebrews talks all about how that Jesus is better. It talks about how that He's better than the angels. How He's better than Moses. And how He is better than all of the high priests that the nation of Israel had. Because Jesus is one who can now sympathize with us. He is one who has been tempted in all things like we are, yet without sin. So can you imagine? There is a God today that can sympathize with you and I because He's been tempted just like us. As a matter of fact, it says that He has been tempted in all things as we are. You know, some people would, they, they would almost seem to say, well, yeah, but I mean, you know, Jesus, He never really failed in the tempting and the testing. So, I mean, does He really understand? Because I fail often. But I guess I would ask you, what kind of example do you want? Just how well do you want someone to have passed the test before you're willing to follow them? Suppose you are driving your car, your truck, and you are driving across a bridge that goes over a large expanse of water, perhaps a river. How much does it mean to you that the concrete on that bridge was tested time after time after time? And whereas your car, truck might weigh two or three tons, uh, that concrete has been tested for 100 tons or more. Do you want a concrete that has been tested and that has perfectly passed that test or maybe one that is just so-so. Man, what kind of God are we looking for? I want a God who has been tested in all things, but yet He's done it all without sin. He has undergone the title of testing even that I will never undergo. If I'm a two-ton person, He is a 1,000-ton person, and He has survived, not only survived, He has been perfect in every testing so that He could say to you and I, I'm a high priest that can sympathize with all of your weaknesses, with everything that you are going through. But again, okay, great. But now, let's talk about some specific ways. I mean, so what? Okay, maybe there is a God who understands me. But I mean, how does that help me in the day-to-day? -day? This, this passage here, man, there's some exciting things in this passage. You know, the verses even right before and right after the one that we just read talk to us about how that this God who is with us, even through the valley, 
And how that this God makes available to us the very things that we need in the midst of that valley. Because I don't know about you, but when I'm going through the tough times, when I'm going through the times of pain, the times of suffering, boy, the times when I just don't understand, in the very tough days, when I'm going, going through those, I need some things. I need some things like given to me in verse 14 here. Because Ephesians, or Ephesians, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14, it says this, again, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, so again now, catch that. We've got not just some earthly high priest. You know, every year the earthly high priest would pass through the tabernacle. Once a year, the high priest would pass through what was called the Holy of Holies. And just in a type, he would pass through and become an advocate to the people on God's behalf. But Jesus, he did not pass through a type. Jesus literally came to this earth, lived a perfect life, died for us, rose again, and then after a number of days being seen by hundreds of people in His risen body, He passes back through the heavens up to God the Father and presents Himself as the perfect sacrifice and the substitute for our sins. So we have a high priest that passed back through the heavens and now sits at the right hand of God who is God and now He can sympathize with you in your very weaknesses. He passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. And so He says, based on that, here's what I need you to understand even in the midst of the valley. Because in the midst of the valley, one of the things that I need is I need perseverance. I need perseverance, right? And so God talks here about how that we are to hold fast to our confession. To hold fast to our confession. The idea that even in the midst of the valley, that He wants to give us perseverance. And what I love about that is it is not just simply the mind attitude that just says, man, just hang in there. You know, whenever tells, somebody tells me, hey, just hang in there. Well, I want to follow that up with, well, hang on to what? And hang on for how long? And how's it going to help me? God doesn't just simply say, persevere. Man, just, just hang in there. I know times are tough, but they'll get better, so just hang in. No. God talks about persevere in the sense of He says, hold fast to something. Hold fast to your confession. Hold fast to your confession in your life that you believe that He, Jesus, is better. That you believe that He is your high priest. Even though perhaps you haven't ever used that wording, but you would say, I believe. I have given my entire life to God. I put my faith in Him. I put my trust in Him. I have confessed that only He can save me. And in doing so, in the valley, in the tough times, hold fast to that confession. You know, again, there are likely some of you here today and you are thinking through the claims of Christ on your life. And may, perhaps you have not. Maybe somebody's invited you to come today and they told you, hey, some guy's talking about the tough times. Why don't, why don't you come hear about it? And perhaps you have not as of yet made that confession of Christ being your Lord, being the master of your life then guess what? Over the next couple of minutes, you can just sit back and enjoy. Because I'm going to be talking just for a minute to those who have made that confession. Hey, didn't you love it when every great once in a while, your teacher back in the day would say something like, you know what? We're going to take a look at this chapter, but this is not going to be on the test. So you're not responsible for this. Just kind of look at it. I would like for you to listen to me, but don't worry about it. Hey, if you have not committed your life yet to Christ, relax. But for those of you who have had, what the writer of Hebrews is saying here is because God is with us, because He came, and because He became one of us, then He says to you, in the middle of the valley, in the middle of the pain and the suffering, 
Man, there's something that you can hold on to, hold fast to your confession, to who I am. You don't have to hold on to yourself. Hold on to the confession in your life of who I am. Hold on to Jesus. Confess Him as your high priest. Confess that He is better than everything else in your life. You see, your confession was never intended to be a secret to keep but rather it's a story to be told, right? Especially in the valley. Do you know what those who don't know Christ need to hear? They need to hear stories of people that are going through the valley and going through the pain and going through the suffering. And even in the midst of that valley, they are holding fast, not to how they feel, not to how their circumstances are treating, but they are holding fast to their confession that Jesus is in fact better. And that even in the midst of the valley, when I don't have all the answers, I am holding on to my confession of who He is. Because I have found Him faithful time after time after time in my life. And how I so enjoy hearing your story and seeing your story. And so many of you, that in the midst of your valley, you are confessing, you are giving your part of the story and about how that God is real and God is with you even through the tough times. In the valleys, God wants to give you perseverance, holding on to that confession of who God is. <laughs> but there's something even more. Because in verse 16, look at it. For just a moment. Verse 16, the writer says, Therefore, based upon what I'm talking about, based upon how God is our high priest, therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Because He is with us, because He's our high priest, that even in the valley, God can not only give us perseverance, but God can in fact give us confidence. He can give us confidence. But again, because He's more, His truth to us is so much more. It is so much more than just, hey, in the midst of your valley, keep your chin up. You know, people say that to me sometimes. Man, keep your chin up. I mean, number one, what does that even mean? But number two, I kind of know what it means, but it's not a whole lot of help to me, frankly. Because in the midst of my valleys, it's not a lot of help just to hear, keep your chin up. And so God doesn't say that. But what God does say is here's how I can give you confidence. I can give you confidence, not simply in yourself, not just that the circumstances will be much better tomorrow, but I want you to draw near something for confidence. Have you ever seen, perhaps like even on a sports team, and how that some people that don't seem to have a lot of confidence, but they learn to draw up to some of the players, to draw close to some of those that do have a lot of confidence. And all of a sudden, their confidence becomes contagious. And that person who did not feel very confident, now all of a sudden, he's with that person. Or maybe it's some people and they are getting up close to somebody who is in a seat of power. And all of a sudden, they are like, well, I'm feeling pretty confident because of who I'm next to. Well, Jesus says, here's where you draw your confidence from in the midst of the valley. You do it by drawing near with confidence. And I love this, to the throne of grace. Now think about that for a minute. What a place to draw confidence from. To draw confidence from drawing, getting close as you can to the very throne. I mean, that speaks right of power. I mean, the throne of the one who is in charge of the entire universe. And yet, even though he's in charge of the entire universe, even though he sits on the throne, it is a throne of what? A throne of grace. A throne of grace that we can hurry to and we can have confidence because we believe that He is in ultimate control. And we go to His throne and we find the kind of grace to do what? So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Anybody here today that needs mercy? 
Yeah, man, we could all raise our hands. Any of us need grace? How do I have confidence in the midst of my valley? It's certainly not because anything that I can generate. It's certainly not any way that I can just grit my teeth and say I'm going to make the best of this. No, but it is rushing myself to the very throne of grace to God and speaking to God, talking to God, looking in God's Word and finding the mercy and the grace that I need in time of need in the valley. Are you doing that today? But listen, it, it gets even better. Not only does God say, I want to give you perseverance through the valley, I want to, in fact, give you confidence, but He's going to go on to say, there's something else that everybody needs in the valley. I found this to be true. You know, when I'm in my valley, there's something that I need. I need a person, right? Don't you? I need a person. You know, sometimes it says, though, that in the valley, you need something more than answers. You need a person. And oftentimes, God brings other people around to us. How many times have you and I experienced a person that comes to walk with you through the valley? And maybe they don't even say a lot. And frankly, I found out that sometimes some valleys can be so deep that you need somebody just to shut up and be there, right? There's not a lot of words you're even looking for. But what you need is a presence. What you need is a person. You need somebody that will just be there with you in the valley and not even be constantly trying to say, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that, but just someone who will be with you. And so we experience that on the human level. And we desperately need to be that type of person for others. But here's the great news of Christmas. Because God came to us, because He became one of us, He has now become our high priest that can sympathize with us because He's been there. And He can be that very person for us. Look at what it says. Here are some great verses in this same chapter and in verse 7. It begins by saying, In the days of His flesh, so when Jesus was here on this earth, when He lived here, look at, look at what He did. Look to His model. Here is a person that can be with you in the tough times. Look at how He modeled it. It says, He offered up both prayers and supplications Look at this next part. With loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. Wow! When Jesus was on this earth, when he was here in the days of his flesh as man, then he continually offered up prayers to God the Father. And he even did those loudly and with tears and crying. Is it not good to know that you have a God that did that Himself? And to know that there is no sin in tears. Jesus Christ shed tears. Jesus Christ cried out loudly to the Father. You think about times like Gethsemane in the night of His betrayal. And how Jesus was in such a valley. And He was about to take on the sins of the very world. And it talks about that He was so oppressed by that, that He began to cry out. He began to sweat, as it were, drops of blood under the pressure of all that. And He knew what it meant to even to be in that type of valley. And to cry loudly to God. And so He can sympathize with you. And I know some of you are perhaps in some very deep valleys this morning. And He did that same thing. And yet He was able to do it without sin. And He wants to help you to be able to come through your valley. You know, here's what I would like to say to you. And perhaps just to remind you, or perhaps some of you are just thinking about this for the first time. But this Jesus Christ, 
who came and was born to that virgin and was the God-man and who lived a perfect life. But he also did something else. You see, there are a lot of religions that you can listen to. And perhaps if you don't know Christ again today, there are lots of religions and people that will give you a lot of good ideas and thoughts about human suffering. And they will provide some helpful things. And they'll try to give some things and principles that will help you in your human suffering. But listen to the news of Christmas. Only Christianity gives you a God who suffered. Only the Bible in terms of the good news of the Gospel, the story of Christmas, only Christianity gives you a God with wounds. See, that's the greatness of Christmas. God didn't just say, hey, I know there's human suffering. Try to work through it. No, He was a God with wounds. He was a God who went through suffering. And only Christianity offers you that. A God but a God who suffered. So I would ask you today, how is that being played out in your life? The fact of God with us. The fact of a God who suffered and knew what all suffering meant. And now He is your high priest who can sympathize with you. Believer, I would ask you, are you busy about telling that story? Are you busy about telling your story? About how in the valley, you're far from perfect. And sure, we stumble sometimes in the valley. And God knows that. But what God desperately wants for you is to know that in that valley, you can persevere, but only because you hold fast to that confession of who He was. And how that you can have confidence, but only through approaching, getting near to the very throne of grace that will give you the mercy and grace you need in time like the valley. And only through pursuing Him will you find that He is that person who can come alongside you and can be the one who knows because you have a God who suffered Himself. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior, I would just say to you, What God has done more for you? There is none. What God has suffered for you? And not just talked about how you should handle suffering. But He has been willing to bleed and to die and to give Himself to the cruelness of the cross because that's what He came for. And through His perfect life and perfect death, He now says to you, I want to pursue a love relationship with you. And I want you to come into relationship with me. And so everybody has to choose. You either pay for your own sin or you find you a perfect substitute to pay it for you. And that's exactly what Christmas is all about. Because that baby in the manger became that perfect substitute and you can run to Him today. Because He suffered for you. God loves you. And any of us that have found that love, we don't for one second believe we're better than you. We just happen to believe we are so much better off because of the Savior that we found. Let's pray together. And even with our heads bowed and as we close our eyes and talk to God in just a moment, and I would ask you, if you have never made your confession of Christ in your life, God, I would ask you even in the silence of this moment to consider all that God has done for you and a God who suffered for you so that He could pay the penalty for your sin. And would you ask Him today to become the master of your life? And that you would give yourself to Him. 
And if you have questions about that, that you would seek someone out, put it down on that card, turn it in so we can talk to you more. And then believer, I would just ask that each one of us, that we would just, are we telling His story? Are we finding Him to be with us even in the valley? Are we taking that comfort and even sharing that with others? Father, thank You for the truth at Christmas, how that You're with us. And not just in the good times, but God, You're also with us even in the valley. And God, next week, we'll remind ourselves that You are even with us in the wilderness. God, thank You that You are with us. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen.